Okay, my apologies for anybody who was in the chat room before. Um, clearly, I have some cheshbon and nefesh to do. I have to figure out what that minya was all about. But be that as it may, um, we're going to continue to try and actually do something holy. Um, you know, I like to consider myself somebody who learns Rabbi Nachman a little bit, so minyos are part of the process. Anyway, let's get started. So, as we were saying... Rav Kook and his Talmidim weren't sure whether this Sefer was meant to be a Sefer that was learned, or whether this was a Sefer that was meant to be a Segula. And there's different opinions in different camps. Some people have attempted to learn the Sefer, Reish Milin. Um, there were attempted Perushim written on it. Uh, the son, the child of Rav Ari Levin, Zecher Tzadik Vakadosh Lebracha, apparently wrote a thousand-page parish on it. It was lost during the war, according to Rav Hadari, who just recently passed away. And when Rav Cook read the Sefer, he said that, or when he saw the manuscript, he said that it's clear that he understood the Kabbalah of it, but he didn't understand the philosophia of it. So there's already an apocryphal sense that this is a Sefer that's off-limits, that's too deep on a certain level. Then you have Talmudim like Rav Chalap and the Nazir, and... Rav Shriki nowadays, who have attempted to understand the Sefer and who have seen in the Sefer a significant attempt by Rav Cook to codify his Kabbalistic thought, um, to show, in a certain sense, how he understood the system of the Arizal and the Kabbalim that preceded him. But be that as it may, I believe that both opinions are correct. I think that on the one hand, this is a Sefer that should be learned, a Sefer that can be understood very clearly if a person puts the proper amount of effort into it. And on the other hand, it's also a sigula in the sense that whatever we can understand from the words of Rav Kook, whatever we can understand in his intention in the Medrash Osios and understanding the Osios, the Asa and Araisa, on a certain level, we can only conjecture as to what he meant. We can only attempt to understand the words of the Rav Kook. Now, this is true typically with Rav Kook's writings in general, that you get caught up in the thicket of his language it's very easy to get caught up in the poetic sensibilities and lose sight of the systematic approach that Rav Kook had to Jewish thought, Kabbalah, philosophy, halacha, agarata, all things in one. But at the same level, we have to also understand that Rav Kook was an individual who wrote, who wrote his soul onto a paper, and it's our job to try and understand him. So as we learn the Sefer of Reish Milin, we have to take into consideration the fact that at times, it will be a systematic approach at understanding the Osios HaTorah, at understanding the Ta'amim of the Osios, the Nakudos of the Osios, the Tagin of the Osios. And there's a systematic approach which aligns with the Ariza and the Ramak and all different Mukubalim that Rav Kook was exposed to. And on the other hand, underneath it all, in the process of what we see with Rav Kook, there's something hidden, concealed within the Sefer that moves beyond what we're capable of understanding. So before we get into the Sefer itself, which we're probably not going to do tonight, I think that it's important to understand the context in which the Sefer was written. Rav Kook had already made it to Eretz Yisrael in the early 1900s, and as he was visiting Europe, on whatever type of trip it was, I'm not 100% sure, historically speaking. But Rav Kook got stuck in London from the years 1916 to 1920, about. He became the Rav in Machzike Hadas there. And Rav Kook, out of Eretz Yisrael, after he tasted the Avir of Eretz Yisrael, was similar to a fish out of water, somebody who didn't have the capacity to breathe properly. I remember in Shana Aleph reading something about Rav Chatzka Levenstein, Zechat Tzadik Lebracha that when he came to America, apparently, he was so nauseated from the air here that he started vomiting, um, something crazy like that. Um, and I believe that Rav Kook probably experienced some of the similar experiences there. So Rav Kook, in describing why he wanted to write Medrash HaOsios Dafka, why he wanted to try and understand not the words of Chazal, not the Sipurim of the Torah, but the building blocks, the DNA, the Osios, the Aleph base. He describes in the Ha'aros, in the back of Sefer Reish Milin, which were printed afterwards, he describes that the thing that drove him into the letters, the thing that drove Rav Kook deeper than what he was typically looking at, was the fact that the world at that time 
during World War I, when the world was raging, and when there was suffering and fighting and hatred in the world. So Rav Kook felt that it was no longer possible for a Jewish individual to be yonik, to draw his spiritual sustenance from the external world. Rav Kook writes very beautifully that there are certain souls who are capable of drawing their sustenance, their spiritual sustenance, from the externalities of the world. They're capable of looking at the natural mode of being, the everydayness of life, and through their speculative notions, through their depth, through their thinking, they're capable of penetrating the depth of experience to find the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the light of God that animates all being. And Arav Cook writes that there comes a time in the world where there's a mahuma, there's a confusion, there's, there's a murmuring underneath everything, which shows a person, when the world shows itself to the person, it's in the veil of hatred, it's in the veil of darkness, it's under a veil of confusion and tohu vavohu, and a spiritually sensible individual who still attempts to draw his strength from that space, that explicit revealed space of the world, will not only be incapable of drawing inspiration, but what they'll draw instead is a poisonous notion of suffering and confusion. At that point, when the world is in disarray, when the order of things is flipped around and there's a transversal of things and what's up is down and down is up and it's an alma de shikra, and there's the veil that conceals the essence of being. So if Cook says that there are certain Saridim Meis Hashem, there are certain unique individuals sent by Hashem to penetrate the veil of being and to force themselves into the interiority of the world. It's no longer enough to look at the externality of the world. A person needs to be able to contemplate and force themselves into the interiority of the world, to break through, to break through the externalities and to penetrate within. Those individuals, Rav Cook said, will then operate according to the Skira Hapni Mith. They will force themselves to look beyond appearances and to believe deeply in the fact that underneath what is apparent, there lies an inapparent essence that enables a person to deeply continue believing in God in spite of the fact that the world is on fire. Rav Cook says that the catalyst for a person to become more pinimi, the catalyst for an individual to start looking deeper into the osios, into the building blocks of reality, is suffering, is confusion, is the existential notions that the philosophers operated with. It wasn't enough for of Cook to give up on the fact that, okay, the world is not running properly right now, let me stop attempting this worldly mysticism. For of Cook, at that point, it was a sign to him along with the biographical information of being stuck in London, that he can no longer operate according to the vehicle of Eretz Yisrael, where Avir the Eretz Yisrael Machakim, where it's enough for a person to walk outside in the fields of Eretz Yisrael and, and smell Ruchnius. In Chutzlar, it's Alad Masnechar, it was fundamental to Rav Kook to penetrate the externalities of the world and to enter into the inside. So Rav Kook writes that it was time to delve into the osios. It was time to draw strength from the osios. Now, what's interesting here is that it would have been enough for Rav Kook to be identified as a mystic who, in times of suffering, found hope and strength in penetrating the esoteric realm of being. Somewhat of what Rav Soloveitchik's criticism of Kabbalah was in certain areas, his criticism of mysticism very much in line with Levinas's criticism of mysticism, which is that the mystic escapes or expresses a deep disinterest in this worldliness for the sake of benefiting on their own individual basis in the oceanic sense of otherworldliness. What the mystical quest is for these thinkers is an escape in a certain sense, an inability, <clears throat> if you will, to deal with the suffering of daily living. But this was not what was Cook was trying to do in Reish Milan, where Cook writes explicitly that his entry into the osios, his entry into the interiority of being was not for the sake of staying there and feeling peaceful until the world settled down. But Rav Kook, who saw himself as a tzaddik ador, felt that his entrance, his, his deep dive into the interiority of things, into the panimiya sadhavaram, was not for the sake of staying there, but was rather to draw strength out of there and bring it back to the externality of the world. 
the Baal Shem Tov and Tzaddikim talk about a Yerida Litzar Chalia, a descent for the sake of ascent. Rav Kook is really describing here as an ascent for the sake of descent, that he wanted to elevate himself to this mystical realm of interiority, of the essence of being, and then to draw out of there and bring it back down into the world of limitation, into the world of concealment, into the world of suffering, whether collective or personal, and endow that standing in the world of limitation, in the world of suffering, in London in 1917, with the world on fire, and to enlighten and inflame that external, broken, fallen reality with this trace, if you will, of what he sensed when he elevated back up to that mystical space. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov writes very similarly that the purpose of the mystic nullification of the tzaddik being nullified in Bittal HaMetzius is not for the sake of remaining in Bittal HaMetzius, which Kav would be saying to Hashem in a certain way, I recognize that you sent me down here, but I feel that I have a better plan. But rather the, the mystical quest, and I'm using the word mystic, and I don't mean it specifically. I don't believe that Rav Kook and Rabbi Nachman and our tzaddikim are mystics in the same way mystics are typically described. But be that as it may, Rabbi Nachman and Rav Kook as well felt that the ascent into the mystical realm of being was only for the sake of drawing down the trace of that experience into mundane reality. For Rav Kook, he was deeply influenced by his Chabad upbringing to operate according to this understanding of Dir B'tach of the fact that what HaKadosh Baruch Hu, what Hashem wants from the world more than a nullification is actually an affirmation of being with the trace of infinitude in it. But nevertheless, Rav Kook's job here was to go deep into the osios and to draw down the light into the brokenness of being. And Rav Kook writes that this itself, autobiographically speaking, this itself was what drew him and what forced him to really write about the osios. Now on this level, I think we can also contextualize a little bit of what Rav Kook was trying to do here, what he describes as medrash osios and elsewhere when we get to the chapter on tagin, on the hooks that connect the letters to the white flame, the empty space, which represents the ability of letters to connect to that which is above them. Rav Kook explicitly associates its project with Rabbi Akiva and the Talmidim of Rabbi Akiva. Now, Rabbi Akiva was uniquely capable of penetrating the depths of being, uniquely capable of looking at a world that appeared devoid of meaning, in a world that appeared devoid of order, and yet at the same moment to be able to penetrate deep into the interiority of things, into the interiority of the letters, he was doireish, he recognized that these letters, which seem empty and barren, contain within themselves storehouses, otsros, the inso, unlimited storehouses. And just like Rabbi Akiva was capable of looking through the veil of being, penetrating through the alma de shikra, through the he'elem of the olam, through the concealment, through the, the hiddenness of God in this world, and he was able to look deeply enough to understand that within the osios, as we'll see, like the Baal Shem Tov tells us, a person can find olamos, neshamos, ve'elokus. A person can find within the osios, within the building blocks of externalized being, a person can find worlds, they can find spirituality, and they can find godliness. Rabbi Akiva tells us, right, that the Tikkunizar and Tikkun Vav describe that the Avnei Shayesh Tahor are the letters Aleph. Different Alpha and different letters scattered around. And Rabbi Akiva's warning to his friends, Rabbi Akiva's warning to his comrades was that when you see empty letters, when you see empty signifiers, things that are fallen, things that no longer represent what they're meant to represent, do not think for a moment that simply because they appear devoid of meaning, simply because they appear stuck in the stuckness of everyday life. That means that they're devoid of essence. But rather, a person has to take a double look. A person has to be patient and look twice and see that within the empty signifier, within the dead language, within the empty metaphors that no longer mean anything to us, a person can deepen their experience and uncover an essence that is deeper than appearances. So when Rav Kook is operating in the world, this Nisham is operating in a world where the world is on fire, the only thing for this tzaddik to do 
was to penetrate deeply into being, was to find that kol mada avid rachman latav avid, and that although the words are dead and the letters are dead, we are capable, either through reading the words of a tzaddik or through connecting to a tzaddik, we are capable of understanding the storehouses of essence and ruchnius that live within the letters themselves. Now, Reish Milin is a remarkable sefer in the sense that it looks at the osios, it looks at the basic building blocks of the Aleph base, and it tells a story. It sees a narrative from the letter Aleph through Tuf. Now, there are two ways of looking at the section of osios, because Rav Cook breaks the sefer up into four parts. Well, more than four parts, really, but the first edition was only four parts. It's osios, nekudos, tagin, and ta'amin. So very similar to the Tanta breakup, the Ta'amin, Nekudos, Tagan, and Osios that the Arizal writes about in, uh, Rav Chaim Vital writes about in the name of the Arizal in Eitz Chaim and in Otsros Chaim, that the world in its entirety is comprised of these four levels of writing letters or reading letters better, that there's the letter itself, there's the Nekuda, there's the vowelation of the letter, that then you're going to have the Tagan, which represent the connectivity between the black letter itself and the white space that holds the letter. And then above all of them, you have the ta'amim, which are the cantillation notes, which mystically speaking represent the loftier space of song, which is beyond verbiage, which is beyond linguistic language, but much deeper, more expressive, more primordial expression of the soul. So it would be one thing if Rav Cook decided to write a parish on the Ariza. But that's not what Rav Cook does. He starts us off with the osios, and he tells a story. Each os, starting from Aleph all the way through Tuf, tells of a different stage in the process of the unfolding of the world from within infinity down to finitude. The story that Rav Cook tells with the letters is the story that the Arizal tells us in Eitz Chaim. It's the story that Rashbi tells us in the Zohar. It's the story that Rabbi Akiva tells us in Gemara. It's the story of what Jewish mysticism, for lack of a better term, has been speaking about since the beginning, which is how does an infinite God, how does a perfect God, an unlimited God, manifest in imperfection, in limitation? What is the process of the unfolding? What are the stages through which God, so to speak, manifests himself towards the point that we can still refer to God as God, we can connect to God through mitzvos and maizim tovim and have an actual relationship with God. While God is infinite, while God is entirely removed from the limitations and the gradations that we operate according to. Now, Rav Kook sees the letter Aleph, so to speak, as the beginning stage. And through Aleph to Bez to Gimel, all the way through Tuf, we have a processional unfolding from up high to down low through which God reveals himself in the world. Now that's one level of understanding the process of the osios, that it's the way that God manifests himself. It's the seder ha'eshtalshalus, or the seder ha'atzilus, the emanatory process through which God describes, or that the Kabbalah describes, how Hashem reveals himself to the world. But for Rav Kook, that wasn't enough. And he saw the Arizal as staying simply on that level of the ontological manifestation of God in this world. Or of Cook following the Zohar, the off-quoted Zohar, which says that B'nai Yisrael, the Torah, and God are unified as one. So of Cook is not satisfied simply seeing the process of Aleph through Tuf as being the manifestation of God, but he also wants to see this as the process of the Neshama thinking. For of Cook, along with most Mikubalim, the Balatanya explicitly, the Arizal, the Rashash, Ravichamaya Morgenstern has basically showed us in this generation that although everybody seems to be disagreeing in significant and varying ways, at their core, if you can properly understand the bedrock or the center point of their system, you realize that everybody is really agreeing. Now for Ravichamaya Morgenstern, this Nikuda, this Nikuda Pnimis of all the different Shitos is that in Sof, can only be mislabish, can only garb itself in chachma. Now what that means, for us psychologically speaking, especially after the psychological inversion of Kabbalistic theory through the Baal Shem Tov and his Tamidim, is that it's specifically in the thought 
of the individual that we are able to perceive the workings of God. That when we witness our thoughts, when we are capable of self-reflection in the truest philosophical sense of the word, we are able to witness the processional unfolding of divinity within our own minds. Now, this is something that Chazal hinted to when they say, that the human being is capable of perceiving their world in their days. Or, like Rabbi Nachman says explicitly in the Ravav, that the Gemara tells us that La Silavo, Tzadikim Yoshim, Itrosehem, Biroshehem, and in the future, in the post you know, eschatological stage, post Geula, that Sadiqim will be sitting with their crowns on their heads. Rabbi Nachman asks a very simple question. He says, it should say, Itrosehem al Roshehem. It should say that their crowns are on their heads, not in their heads. But Rabbi Nachman points out, he says that Itrosehem Biroshehem means that what the Sadiqim will be capable of recognizing is that within our own thought, within the epistemological experience of each and every individual, within their own experience, both emotionally speaking and conceptually speaking, we are able to perceive the same workings of God within creation. So if Cook is not satisfied with just describing the unfolding and the emanatory system through which God reveals himself in this world through the Osios, but he also wants to show us how our thought manifests. So Aleph through Tuff is also going to be the story of a thought. It's going to be the story of the kernel of thought that rests within the will, the desire that precedes thought and is untangible. All the way through the different processes of psychological manifestation until we get to tough, which is actual action. So Rav Kook sees in the Aleph through tough not only Hashem revealing himself in the world, but also the human being thinking and manifesting a thought in the world. And lastly, Rav Kook also sees the Aleph through Tuf as the process through which Hashem manifests in the Torah. How divine will, how can it be that divine will can manifest itself, can implant itself in its unlimited fashion within a text? The textuality of the Torah, the words of the Torah, the Eish Shechira al Gabe Eish Levana, the contradictory statement that Chazal already tell us that the Torah itself is an infinite text that is somehow contained with infinitude. Like the Ramban tells us in the Hisaktama to the Torah that the Torah in essence is infinite and any grasp that we have of the Torah is quite frankly a misreading of the Torah. I remember from Shana Aleph there's a teaching from Rav Hanum Wasserim and Hashem Yim Komdomo where he says, Torah Sashem Tamim HaMeshivas Nafesh the Torah Hashem Tamim, what does it mean that the Torah of God is perfect? It means that when you take the sum total, the totality of any thought, any word, or any statement that was ever applied to the Torah, whether it was through Gemara, Rishonim, Achreinim, Ad Hayom Hazeh, if you take all of that into consideration, we can still say that Torah Hashem Tamim. We still have the capacity to say that the Torah itself has never been penetrated. That the Torah itself has never even begun to be understood. So what Rav Kook sees in the Aleph Beis, as he describes it in Reish Milin, is not only the process through which Hashem manifests Kav Yachal in the world of limitation, it's not only how a human being manifests the infinite desire, the undefined desire where a person is quite simply connected to God all the way to action, but he also sees it as the story of infinitude manifesting itself in textuality, which is a profoundly Jewish idea as opposed to, say, Christianity, which emphasizes word becoming flesh, as Elliot Wolfson stresses so often in many of his books. Judaism stresses flesh becoming word. But at the end, we become a text, we become a Torah. Like the Balatanya teaches us that if a person can penetrate the veil of being enough, what they will come to find is that the Aleph base is all that there is. Now, we'll see this much later on, but very quickly, after the Osios, Rav Kook goes on to discuss the Nekudos. Now, we're not going to start a discussion of the Nekudos because the Nekudos are, quite frankly, the Ruach, the spirit of the letters, without which the letters would be domain, the letters would be empty vessels that were devoid of any significance. The letters, that the vowels themselves are what allow us to express the words in any coherent 
communicative fashion. Rav Cook will continue to go on and discuss the Tagen. Now the Tagen already allow us to see how Rav Cook sees his whole system within the Kabbalistic system of the Arizal. <coughs> the Balatanya writes in Shar Yichud Vamuna, which is based on different writings in the Baal Shem Tov, and explicitly based on certain writings in more primary Kabbalists before the Arizal, the Ramak, and, and what the Ramak compiled from. But that creation, in a certain sense, is a compilation of letters. That creation is textual. And just like the analyst or the psychologist described that a person's dream must be textually understood in order to be properly interpreted, so too the Mekubalim saw the world as a text that needed to be unscrambled, that needed to be properly written. Now, Ruf Cook sees the Tagen as the hooks that allow us to connect the fallen letters, the empty letters that mean nothing, and return them back to their primordial space. We know that part of the creation narrative that the Arizal describes is that after the originary Simpson, after Hashem, paradoxically speaking, concealed himself, concealed himself in order to disclose himself in a limited but perceivable manner, there was this catastrophic traumatic breaking described as Shirat HaKelim, shattering of the vessels. Now the Leshem Shavu Vachalom of Shlomo Yoshev, a teacher of Rav Kuk, who, as we'll see, can be found very much in the Sefer Reish Milin, in my opinion, but I see the Leshem everywhere, so it's not a Raya. But the Arizal says that this Shirat HaKelim can be understood as the falling of letters that had originally expressed the will of God or the word of God, and the breaking apart of those letters and those letters falling down and creating and constituting experience as we know it. So our job as Jewish people, in terms of tikkun olam, in terms of being mevarer from the shivrei kalim, from the broken vessels, is to quite frankly sift through piles and piles of scrambled letters, of words that had become jumbled, of words lost in translation, whether it's communication between a man and a wife that's no longer understood properly, whether it's communication between man and himself that's no longer understood properly. Our job is to sift through this jumbled linguistic pile of filth, to be mavarer and elevate ourselves from babbling, from being unable to speak and move towards clarified speech, move towards dibor ha'eloki, the godly speech. Now, these letters, these fallen letters, remain dormant within creation. And when we're being mavara chalakim of the shira, when we're elevating fallen sparks, what we're really doing is we're trying to bring letters back up to their primordial space. Now, the Arizal describes at length that in order to elevate these letters back to their primordial space, they have to be connected to the vocalization of the individual. There has to be nikudos and there has to be ta'amim associated with them. To the point that Kriya Satora for the Arizal, he spends a lot of time discussing this in Eitzchayim, that Kriya Satora is a very valid example of the entire process of birur and tikkun. That when you look at the Torah itself, all you have is letters and tagin, without any cantillation, without any vowelization. And the job is for the Adam, the Maha Chadash, this ore of tikkun to come down and look at these words with the proper intention and apply the proper vowelization and cancellation to them in order to elevate them back up to their primordial space. And through that, we rectify the fallen letters and we bring them back to their original splendor, if you will. So we see that according to the Arizal, the letters themselves, devoid of the ta'amim or the nakudos, represent the fallenness of being. They represent the broken part, the miscommunication, the lack of translation. So what Rav Cook says is that first we have to understand the letters. And once we understand the letters, we can then properly try and understand how we can elevate these letters back up to their primordial space. Now the tagin represent the hooks. The tagin represent the fact that although things are fallen, there's still hope. Without the tagin, which Rabbi Akiva Dafka, Rav Cook says, was the one who tried to be Doresh them because Rabbi Akiva saw a world that was entirely broken and at the same point, he believed deeply that although it's broken, it can still be elevated back. That gamzu latova. 
Then through the Tagen, we have access to the Nakudas and the Tamim, which will manifest in the full Tikkun. So Rav Kuk goes through Osios, then he'll go through Nakudos, and each Nakuda will tell a story. And then he goes to the Tagen, and each letter, the Shatnes gates, the seven letters that have Tam, that have Tagen on them will be understood in their own particular manner. And after that, we finally understand, we're able to finally understand the Ta'amin. We're able to understand the cantillation. In the cantillation process that Rav Kook describes in Reish Milin, it's one of the more profound areas of Rav Kook's writing. Because for Rav Kook, the Ta'amin was the mystical experience. Now, each cantillation point, each Tam that Rav Kook describes represents another psychological state of the mystic or the tzaddik in his way towards cleaving to Hashem. But again, we're going to leave the Nakudos and the Tamim and the Tagan aside for now because it will be a little while until we get there. And we're going to stick with the Osios. Now, next week, Bezra Hashem, we're going to start with the letter Aleph, which for of Cook is the constitutive letter of the entire Aleph base. But today I want to contextualize a little bit of what Rav Cook's project was with the Osios. Now, there's a long history, as Rav Cook was explicitly aware, of Mikubalim and different thinkers attempting to understand the stories of the Osios. The beautiful teaching, and I don't really know the source of the teaching, other than Michael Fishbane in one of his books, which I'm forgetting now, I think it's a, it's a purple and gray book, I'm forgetting the title of it, I think it's Biblical Hermeneutics, or The Garments of Torah, actually. And he writes famously, and this is a well-known teaching, that when discussing Hashem, very often we use the rejoinder term, kavyacho, meaning to say that we're talking about God, we're talking about something, but at the same point, we want to remind ourselves that we're talking on a metaphoric level so that we never get caught up in the fear of Hagshama, or the anthropomorphization of God, or applying physical qualities to God. So Sadiqim and Mikubalim and mystics and philosophers typically use the word kavyacho to kind of soften the statements that they were making to show that, yeah, I'm saying this, but really I'm not really saying exactly what I claim to be saying. Now, Fishbane points out that Kavyacho is understood by the Mikubalim, and it really could be a Tikkun Zohar now that I'm thinking of it, that Kavyacho can also be read as Kaf Beis Yacho, that the 22 make it possible. Meaning to say that any language, any attempt to determine anything, whether it's about the Torah, about God, or about the human being, is only through the letters. The letters represent the Hagvalah, they represent the limitation of the divine will. They represent the limitation of the vocal sounds that without having linguistic markers or signifying letters to contain our thoughts, we would be quite literally incapable of communicating anything. So the letters already represent the first inception of our capacity to convey anything meaningful. Now, Kav Yachol can also be seen as Kav Bez Yachol. It's only through the 22 letters themselves that were capable of conveying anything. Famously, the Vilna Gon, who Rav Kook was also deeply inspired by, and forget inspired, influenced by, in terms of his Kabbalistic thought, in terms of his halachic thought, he wrote Perushim on the Vilna Gon's Perushim on Shulchan Arach. Now, the Vilna Gon, I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that when the Vilna Gon's Cheder Rebbe came to Vilna, his Cheder Rebbe, the one who taught him the Aleph base, came to Vilna, that the Vilna Gon celebrated his, his appearance in the town of Vilna, and he showed great respect for him, and his Talmidim were asking him, what exactly is, you know, this Chiba Yaseira that the Vilna Gon was showing to this rabbi? And the Vilna Gon said that he taught me everything I know. And in a certain level, the Vilna Gon was correct, that by learning the Aleph base from this person, by learning the building blocks of language, the Vilna Gon basically was capable of understanding the DNA of any thought that he was going to have in the future. Without the Aleph Bez, there would be no capacity to say a word, there would be no capacity to say a sentence, there would be no capacity to make any coherent statement about anything. Rav Menachem and Mishklov, another Talmud, Talmud Mufak, if you will, of the Vilna Gon, explicitly writes in his parish on the Idra Zuta, Mayim Adirim, that all a Jewish person ever learns is the Aleph Bez except that there's different permutations of the Aleph base. 
Now, depending on the level of thought that a person is operating on, depending on whether they're learning Gemara, whether they're learning Zohar, whether they're learning Kabbalah, whether they're learning Mishnah, whatever they're learning, it's simply a question of the permutation of the Aleph base. It's not a question of a distinction of essence, but rather just the changing of the forms. And I think Idel, Moshe Idel likes to claim from this teaching from Rav Menachem Mendel of Shklov that the Talmidim of the Nagon were influenced by Rav Avram of Ulafia, another very important historical figure, 11th or 12th century prophetic makubal, if you will, prophetic Kabbalist who attempted to, through Tserufe Osios, through playing around and reorganizing and recombining different Osios, that very much like the Gemara's description of Betzalel, who was Yodea Tserufe Osios, who understood the permutations of the Osios, that he was able to understand the secrets of nature, the secrets of being, and he was able to build the Mishkan. Now, Idel wants to claim that this notion that everything we ever learn is contained within the Aleph base, and we never learn anything more than the Aleph base. We simply change the letters around to create different formulations. So he wants to claim that Rav Menachem and Lemishklav was also influenced by prophetic Kabbalah of the Osios. But be that as it may, whether that's true or not, Rav Menachem and Lemishklav is saying a very significant idea, which brings to light a deeper understanding of the story about the Vilna Gon and celebrating his Cheder Malamed coming to town. But the Aleph base itself, the Chas base Osios HaTorah, is all we will ever learn. It's the building blocks of reality. It's the building blocks of thought. It's the building blocks of significance. So for Rav Kook to decide at a time of suffering, at a time when the world was on fire, to re-attempt to understand the Aleph base again, shows not only an attempt to return into the interiority of things, but also a return to simplicity. This comes out clearest with the Baal Shem Tov and his Talmidim. The Baal Shem Tov and their Talmidim, the long history of Midrash Osios, which starts with Osios Derbe Akiva, through the Sefer Yetzira, through the Sefer Hatmuna, through the Ramak's attempt in Pardes Shimonim to codify certain processes of the letters, through the Arizal and his learning of Tanta and the Tan and the Kudos, Tagan and Osios, we also find, by the Baal Shem Tov and his students, the profound re-entrance into the significance of the letters. Now, famously, this is a teaching that comes clearest in the parsh of Noach, when Hashem says to Noach, Bo el ateva, in the Baal Shem Tov al there's a, a long arichos about the notion of a person entering into the words that they're saying, entering into the letters themselves. I know that the Chabad Museum in Brooklyn, in Crown Heights, there was an exhibit once where they had these life-size letters that people were actually able to walk into. And I believe that somewhere in one of the plaques it said Boel Ateva. It was built on this idea that a person has to enter into the letters. Now, the first Makor we have for the Baal Shem Tov's reassociation about the significance of the Aleph base itself is in his letter that he wrote to his brother-in-law, Rav Gershon Kitzaber, famous letter where he describes his Aliyah HaNeshama, Teheichal HaMashiach, where Mashiach, when the Baal Shem Tov asks Mashiach, Asimar, and Mashiach answers the Baal Shem Tov that Kishiyah Futsumayan Nasecha Chutza, that when your wellsprings burst forth, which is culminated in Chabad, which is wholly focused on spreading forth the warehouses and the storing and the, and the waters and rivers of Sisrei Torah as well as Mashiach saying to the Baal Shem Tov that when people are capable of making Yehudim, unifications like you, which I've seen in the name of Richemaya Morgenstern represents Breslov, Yehudim, not Yehudim in the sense of Lurianic unifications, but Yehudim in the sense that, like we see by Matat and Chanoch, that behold Tefira v'Tefira, every stitching of a shoe that he would do while he was working as a shoemaker, he would be miyachid yichudim. That Hasidus and Breslov in particular saw an emphasis on living in the moment and being miyachid that moment. So in this letter, in this famous letter, the Baal Shem Tov ends off saying, I don't remember exactly what the yichudim that I learned were, but what I do remember is that every word, every letter that comes out of a human being's mouth, whether in Torah, whether in tefillah, and then the Baal Shem Tov says something amazing, It's not only in the words of Torah 
and tefillah that we have to be miachid, that we have to see essence in the osios. But it's b'chol dibor v'dibor, and any word that we speak to ourselves, to another person, or to the world around us. That within each and every letter the Baal Shem Tov writes, a person can find olamos, neshamos, ve'elokos. Worlds, souls, and godliness. Now, Kabbalistically speaking, that could be understood as what the Arizal describes with Shira Sakhalim, that every vessel that broke, every letter that fell, had within it three aspects. It had something called Orot, it had something called lights which remained above, it had something called Nitzotzot, the sparks, the residual sparks that remained trapped within the vessel or the letter as it fell, and Kalim, and vessels. So these three align very nicely with Olamas Neshamas Ve'alokus, but for our sake, all it means is that what the Baal Shem Tov brought to us was the fact that each and every letter, the Aleph Beis, the DNA, the monads that create being, the irreducible points of significance, contain within themselves storehouses of meaning. That instead of a person running towards all the complications and the Cheshvonos Rabos of understanding more and more in the realm of Torah, of learning more and more, of knowing more, of being able to discuss more, that there's a certain tamimus associated with the return back to the letters themselves, to the building blocks of it, to be able to say the aleph, bays, with a recognition that contained within the aleph, contained within the bays, contained within these spiritual markers that retain an aspect of what they come to signify, is storehouses, is the ability for a person to feel comfortable within what they're learning at that moment. Now, the Baal Shem Tov in numerous places and the Magad is Talmud kind of stresses and goes through the different osios. But what's most important, as we'll see next week when we learn the letter Aleph, the Magad and his Talmudim did not see really a differentiation between the 22 letters of the Aleph base. All they saw was one Aleph and two Alephs and three Alephs and four Alephs and so on and so forth to the point when you come to Tuf, it's nothing but 22 Alephs which is a remarkably important teaching, especially when coming to understand the emanatory system of the unfolding of creation, which Rav Cook is coming to show us, is that it's not gradual or step-by-step -step where there's differentiation between each step, but rather it's a process of emanation, of atzilut, where each stage, each new stage of unfolding is nothing but a reiteration and a new different permutation of that which preceded it. So that even when a person finds themselves at the end of the Aleph page, which represents death, which represents concealment and tough and the Arba Meos Ish of Esav and the 400, you know, worlds of negativity that a person can confront when they pass away, that the tough is nothing different than the Aleph except that it's been condensed and concealed 22 times. That each and every letter is nothing but the iteration of the Aleph, the Aluf Shav Olam, the Pela Elyon, the remarkable wonder, wondrous capability of the infinite to manifest itself in infinity. So we will see that what Rav Kook is doing here, Rav Kook is not simply coming and creating his own thoughts. He's not simply coming and being mash'ir as if there was no connection of what he was saying to the entirety of Jewish history and Jewish thought. But Rav Kook's writings, especially in Reish Milin, can be explicitly understood in association in the historical context of Medrash Osios. But at the same point, Rav Kook in his own poetic license, and his own language, was profoundly capable of expressing not only the deepest of secrets, but somehow, some way, making those secrets evocative enough to shake us out of the religious and spiritual stupor that we find ourselves in. And so as we begin to learn the Sefer of Reish Milin, as we begin to look into the Osios, in a time that I can't imagine more fitting for a group of people to realize that the externalities of the world are no longer doing it, a person can be miyayish every day if they look at the externalities of the world. So it might be a time that's Kedai to look into the Osios, to look into the beginning of language, to look at what precedes language, to try and understand and believe more importantly than anything, the fact that there is essence behind appearances and that there is meaning behind what we confront on a daily basis. And I think that Rav Kook will be a very important guide in this process. And Bezra Sashem, 
next week, we're going to start with the letter Aleph. I want to thank everybody for joining me tonight. I apologize again for the whatever that was before, the mania, if you will, that prevented us from, from really starting properly. But, and I wanted to crawl under a rock, but my wife pushed me to start again. So here we are in Bezra Hashem. We will do it through emails. And, um, and anybody who's interested will be able to join me, Bezra Hashem, um, next week. Okay. Thank you, everybody.